Yes. You're there, Simon. Thank you. Well, welcome to you all for um, another Black History Lunchtime conversation. Um, we're now in season three, and this is the third session um, that we've um, we've uh, uh, had. So we're just uh, getting up our PowerPoint, and Simon can put that onto um, full screen. Okay, so. Um, we're going to be welcoming in a moment uh, Lawrence Scott. He's going to introduce his latest historical fiction, which is Dangerous Freedom, the story of Dido Bell. Um, so that will be just in a moment, but we just wanted to do an update. We wanted to thank um, uh, Bunmi, uh, who was um, presenting uh, last week, as well as uh, uh, from her Sankova Pan-African production. So she's um, interested in our work and we're interested in what she's doing and the way she's she's telling black history. Um, also last week, um, we were joined by John Evans to tell us more about the chalice that was uh, found that um, uh, is in the Museum of uh, Cardiff um, and tells a really interesting story about a trader in West Africa. But uh, just a little bit of news this week we've got is that um, I was just told that Sir Jeff Palmer is now heading the um, uh, 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 committee for the Scottish Museums. Uh, maybe David will tell us more about that later. But also, um, we have to congratulate Sir Jeff Palmer, who has now been um, appointed Chancellor of Edinburgh University. And that's great respect and recognition for the work that he's done. And Sir Jeff Palmer's joined us on previous occasions here. But now we're going to go right on and, uh, and introduce um, Lawrence. Um, his latest book, and uh, I was able to, to join Lawrence and colleagues, um, uh, particularly Polly Patillo, um, who uh, it's her publishing company it's, uh, that's published this. And she's somebody I've got a great deal of respect for and who's supported activities that I've been involved in in the past. So it's uh, what we're going to be hearing about is the story of Dido Bell, who was immortalized in this painting. So it's not a very good reproduction, but um, we don't to be had up for copyright. Um, and it's the original is hanging in scone. Do you say Scone or Schoon? Castle in Perth. The Scottish home of the Melville it's family. Schoon. Schoon. Schoon, right. Thank you, David. However, according to English heritage, she also spent much of her life at Kenwood House on Hampstead Heath in North London. And there's actually quite a lot of information on the internet about Dido Bell. So we're very much looking forward to um, now welcoming um, Lawrence to, to tell us about his book. And then we're also going to be discussing how the book meets contemporary issues about race and identity. And then we're going to be talking about how colonial history is documented in great house, houses and institutions and how bringing this to the surface helps to develop more understanding about British colonial history. So I can't tell you how delighted we are, Lawrence. So uh, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. And I'd like to thank Liz for inviting me on and giving Polly's publishing house, Papillot Press, which is based in Dominica in the Caribbean and here in London, um, a little bit of a platform um, so you saw the, the, the portrait there of the famous portrait who we now know is by David Martin, the Scottish painter um, of Dido Bell and Elizabeth Murray. Um, it's only recently, well not, yes, only recently we know it's by David Martin, the Scottish painter, who worked in the studio of Alan Ramsey, who was quite a famous Scottish painter as well, painting court um, portraits and the Mansfield, other Mansfield portraits. But for a long while, this portrait was known as the portrait of Elizabeth Murray, that is the white woman in the painting, and a negress. It was known as that for a long time. And also as the portrait of Elizabeth Murray and a maid. Not quite sure why people thought a maid would be dressed up in that particular way. It's a very conflicted portrait for me, and we could perhaps come to discuss that at some point. 
but who was Dido Bell? Liz asked me to make sure everybody knew who Dido Bell was. So Dido Bell is the daughter of John Lindsay, that is Lord Mansfield's nephew, and an African woman, an African enslaved woman, Maria Bell, um, whom he met in Florida, or possibly on a ship near Havana. History is not absolutely certain about this. And Dido was born to them in 1761. They bring Dido to England, that is Maria Bell and John Lindsay. And Dido is placed with John Lindsay's uncle, Lord Mansfield, who is the Chief Justice of England and was the Chief Justice of England for 32 years. And she grows up at Kenwood House, principally, and a house in Bloomsbury Square, which was Mansfield's townhouse. Um, and Lady Elizabeth Murray, the white woman in the portrait, she comes also as a little girl to live there. Her mother died. She is the daughter of Lord Mansfield's other nephew. So these two girls, the mixed race girl and the white girl grew up together. Um, but the mixed race girl, Dido, is neither, she's illegitimate and she's neither family nor servant. And she's caught between these people in this household. Um, she never eats with the family, she, but she always joins them after meals to sit in the drawing room and listen to the talk. That's very important and very important for my novel. Um, and Dido gets educated and she becomes almost um, Lord Mansfield's amanuensis and copies his letters, reads to him and so forth. Um, in 1793, she gets her freedom, a freedom which is confirmed in Mansfield's will of 1783. Dido then, at the end of 1793, Lord Mansfield dies at the beginning of 1793, Dido leaves Kenwood. Um, she's married now to a man called John Davini, who is a steward. Um, unlike, for instance, I don't know whether many of you have seen a film called Bell, by the African director Ama Asante. And that is that tells the story, tells the same story, but in a very different way, from a very different perspective. Um, and in that, in the film, she's married to a radical lawyer. She would not have been able to get married to a radical lawyer um, where she stood in the hierarchy of 18th century society. So that's a bit of a... Um, she has three sons, um, and Lord Mansfield, what is very important to the story of Dido, but to my story, is that he judges two very important cases to do with the slave trade. One is to do with the, the result of the man called James Somerset being recaptured in England and an attempt to send him back to Jamaica or to the Americas. Um, and man rules on that, that there's no law in England to be able to recapture an enslaved person and send them back. He himself said it was a very narrow judgment. Many people were hoping it was a kind of real precedent and it actually heralded um, emancipation, but it didn't. Um, in fact, the recapture of people intensified enormously during that period. So that's the kind of basic story of who Dido Bell is and her relationship to the Mansfield household. That's the backstory. And it's been romanticized, right? Just at the beginning of March, on the front pages of the mail, uh, the mail on Sunday, I think, um, on the 4th of March, might not be been Sunday. This, there was a, a podcast by the Duchess of Rutland speaking to the Lady Mansfield of Schoon Palace, rehearsing this story of Dido Bell as a black aristocrat. Um, and rehearsing also the story disputed by many historians that Lord Mansfield sort of really got the abolition movement going. That, and many historians would not accept that. So there's a kind of a romantic view of Dido and Lord Mansfield that is very often put out there. And in many ways, my novel is challenging that. I have returned to this history to 
address that and to redress it in some way. My novel is told from the point of view of Dido, of Dido Bell, but now as Elizabeth Davinier. She is married, she's not at Kenwood, she's living in Pimlico, and she's living with her three sons and her husband, John de Vigne, Lydia, a housekeeper, and Lydia's brother. Um, and she is telling her story. She's looking back on her childhood and looking back on her growing up at Kenwood and at Bloomsbury House in Bloomsbury Square. And she's looking back to her childhood, which we know something about now. Because when I started my research, um, the curator at Kenwood House directed me to an archaeologist in Pensacola, Florida, telling me, called Margot Stringfield, who found, she thinks she's found evidence of Maria Bell, Dido's mother, um, as an archaeologist searching in a well at a particular um, plot of land where she thinks John Lindsay lived with Maria Bell and also finding a document that perhaps suggests that Maria Bell bought her freedom for $200, though she had been, it seems, given her freedom by John Lindsay in 1774, when she went back to Pensacola, leaving her daughter with the Mansfields. So I'm just gonna read a little bit from the novel, um, some excerpts um, to give you an idea of how I'm tackling this. So the present in the novel is Elizabeth de Vigne, the early part of the 19th century, 1802, 1803, uh, but looking back on the 18th century, looking back on her childhood. But what I'm going to read is I'm going to read um, where she is recalling how she first learned about some of these trials that Lord Mansfield was judging um, on James Somerset and the Zong case, the famous Zong case, where 131 enslaved Africans were pitched into the sea. Um, I'll come to that later. So the very first extract I'm going to read is actually not to do with either of those, <laughs> but to do with the Strong, um, a young man called Strong, who is also captured um, in London and beaten up. And Dido gets this information as she's growing up from her mother, whom she's visiting until between 1765 and 1774, this information about the world, and she's getting it from there, but she's also getting it from sitting in the drawing room at Kenwood House or Bloomsbury Square, um, listening to the Mansfields and their guests talking. And this is an excerpt where she has gone to Greenwich, where her mother has been put to live by John Lindsay, who kept there. Um, yeah. And the mother is talking here to Daidu. You know because I tell you enough, Dido, since that time on the ship, when we leave Pensacola to come to this place, that he will send me back and that you must stay here. It's not you, child. It's not you. It's not he. It's not me. It's the time we're living in that make things so. Yes, he have some power, but the man that have the real power is the man whom you call master. The same blood that flowing in your father veins is the same blood in his and in yours. You're right to call him master. One day I trust he will leave to you papers that have it marked that you is free. You must wait for that. And when you get that, maybe then you will choose and come to me. Choose to leave that master. It's the same piece of paper I must get from your father for I am his slave in law. He can't send me back without it. The story I didn't tell you. The boy strong, find his way to Mincing Lane. There was a surgeon there, William Sharp, a good man who served the poor of the city. Sharp had a brother. You tell me you hear his name mentioned in Bloomsbury. Granville is his brother. My master doesn't like the sound of his name. Dido said, I sure he don't, but let me tell you how it go for that young man. Strong get admit to St. Bartholomew's. He get fixed up 
and Mr. Sharp so kind, he get him a job in Fenchurch Street with a Mr. Brown, who was lucky to be an apothecary. Master called Mr. Sharp a confounded man, always complaining. You listen to what I say. I tell you the story so you go understand. You're hearing too much talk from the side, one side only. Two years later, that same lie, the scoundrel, see strong in the street. He follow him to his house and then employ catchers to capture him and sell him for 30 pounds. They keep him in poultry compter, the prison in the city, till they hear of a ship to the West Indies. Master says I must, I might get captured if I walk in the street. He better protect you. I mustn't walk in the square in Hoban. Listen what I tell you. These people think that they have the run of the world and that there is no law or law that people must obey. Strong get a letter to Granville Sharp and he bring the case to court. That is what master complains about. Mr. Sharp always bringing things before him in the court. You're sounding just like them. Listen how you're speaking. You listen to your mother. That man is so great, is in mansion house that Strong get discharged. They say Strong not guilty of anything, no offense, and therefore he had liberty to go. They have bad men about these streets, but there's some good men too, the judge and Mr. Granville Sharp. They say that even in the court, the captain of the ship tried to seize Strong, but there's a bad end to this tale. The Jamaican planter, who buy strong because the judge say that not become free because he come to England. Dido listened with open mouth. She kept thinking of her own fate. Hear what I tell you. He not free because he's breathing English air. I tell you so before. He not free because he baptize. It's the same thing I tell you before. He quotes some judgment by other judges from long time. They say Sharp not leaving, having, leaving it so. He go follow it up. He go appeal. We have to listen out. Dido began to lose her mother's speech with all the details. She listened at times to her mother and she also listened to her father. She needed her mother to bring things down to earth for her. When she told her what her father had said, her mother replied, you think he tell you everything? You mustn't believe every sweet thing that sweet man pour into your ear. So Dido gets those views from her mother um, as she goes to visit her. But then she is back with the Mansfields and she gets other views. And this is when she first begins to hear about the James Somerset case, a very, very important case that Mansfield judged. It was part of a story Master told Lady Betty and the company in the drawing room that evening. Dido had just come in having changed her apron and was trying her, drying her hands from her chores in the pantry. Beth paid no attention. Her eyes were lowered and concentrating upon her sewing. She laid it out on her stool and then went to the spinet to play a tune, which she knew would please her great uncle. She had chosen a Scottish ballad. It was that which reminded Dido's master of the story he had first heard from a friend in Scotland. The story of the escape of an American gentleman slave who had come with him from Norfolk in Virginia. I just interrupt to say that of course the Mansfield family are Murrays from Schoon in Perthshire and Mansfield is an English title that William Murray got when he came to England and then became Chief Justice in England. The gentleman had brought the man in that town at an auction. Charles Stuart Esquire was the man's owner. He was also associated with that town. They heard a lot of at that time, Boston in Massachusetts. Dida could not hold all the information which her master gave to the company. She heard the words cashier and paymaster of customs at the port of that same town. This gentleman's man was now a runaway in London. 
and Dido was imagining him at large, along the lanes, in hovels, in alleyways, and under hedgerows. She imagined him by the river, hunkered down in a boat, moored on the mudflats, waiting for the tide. How would she have survived? It was like an adventure, as she retold it to herself later in bed, was sitting on the windowsill, listening to the wind in the trees. Could this happen to her? She had noted his name in her diary, Somerset. Little did she know then that his name would come to inhabit the house at Bloomsbury Square and dominate their lives for a whole year and change their lives beyond anything, echoing through the king's realm in all the newspapers and as far as his colonies in America and in the West Indies and accompanying her to the dairy and to the poultry or just while she was stood at the window and watch Master and Beth go out for their afternoon ride as far as Lord Southampton's Park. It affected the mood at Christmas that year. Little did she know that she would become so familiar with the life of this man, James Somerset. And all the while, Beth paid, no atten paid attention to her sewing during her master's first telling of that story. It was how they, Beth and Dido, were different. On the stairs, Beth said to Dido, as they went up to bed, Aren't you really a slave, Dido? Might it not happen to you, be captured and sent back to wherever, a plantation in Jamaica, sent back in irons? Do you not fear that? So she had been listening, Dido thought, and she had not even pricked her finger with her sewing needle. Dido did not answer her question. Beth had not even dropped her pattern on the floor. She thought, all seeming seamless, not shocking, with her own life and the music she played. Mr. James Somerset's search had been a yearning for liberty. He was running away from his master, running into the fields of England, through every hedgerow, down every alley and lane for his freedom his plight was always on her mind. Dido remembered how once, when she had visited her mother at Greenwich, before she had left for Pensacola, she had told her what she had overheard at Canewood, and she had replied in that inimitable way, his modern rumour child, along the lanes of Greenwich and Deptford, or up St Giles. It's spreading across the wheels and moors, up and down dales. There was such a geography of clamour for a verdict. Her mother told her, it stretched across the ocean and forced its voice, found its voice in the hills of Virginia and in the ports of Boston and the Carolinas. If only her mother could have It was torn between her mother. Okay. Okay. That James Somerset. It's okay, carry on. That James Somerset might as well set sail for Jamaica, her mother said, and see if the sea breeze do him any good. Is not the air of England or the holy waters of their baptism will free him. This was her repeated joke. She explained that her people were crowding into the courtroom to listen and to hope. Even we people believe that man, who you call your master, has the words of freedom on his tongue. Then she laughed. Her mother could laugh so much. She too laughed. And they went out to find some amusement in the streets down by the river. So that is how Dido, in a way, gets to know about what's going on in the country. She hears from her mother when she had access to her mother before 1774. And mostly she's getting the views in the drawing room sitting there. Did you want to say something, Liz? I apologize, the, the, uh, the connection went for a moment. Right. But I it's guess, okay now. Yeah, I'll just read a last little excerpt when she begins to hear about the, the, the very important case, the Zong case, 
and then I'll bring up the points that we said we'd like to discuss. Today, Elizabeth was led to the story of the ship, the Zong. So it's Elizabeth who is thinking back to when she was died of. Story of the ship, the Zong, mentioned in her letters to her mother. She did not want to be near to that story. She remembered it had been Mr. Equiano who had alerted Mr. Sharp to that fateful ship and the story of the murders. It was the first time she had heard the writer's name. Her master had fallen from his horse that year. Why was that inserted there in her memory now? Might the injury have affected his judgment? Her mind was suddenly on fire. It was while she was nursing him that he mentioned the name of Olauda Equiano, the African. Names and facts shrieked at her with the persistent clarity of the insane she sometimes could hear coming over the marshes from Locke's asylum. She eventually found what she was looking for. She remembered she had written to her mother at the time of the Zong case. She recalled it well after all these conversations during the evenings over coffee. She still refused at that time to have any sugar. It was all she could do to keep Beth awake and insist that she listen to these extraordinary stories they were hearing. Returning to the desk in her room, she would sit up late, beginning under candlelight, day after day, until each letter was completed and handed in to Lady Betty for posting. Dearest mother, to whom can I speak openly of this matter? I cannot sleep. When my master paused in the court, it was portentous. I too shuddered. What was it that would make a courtroom shudder? This is what we are told. The paper, the name Zong, told like a death knell. Another word was Tobago the small island. Do you remember, in the distance, I sneaked to look at the maps in the library with my candle. I spun the globe. Was it not on that journey, on my father's ship, that journey to Cartagena, when I was a small child? Do you remember, my father pointed. It surprised me all these years later to hear that the Zong was lost off Tobago, adrift miles from its destination to Kingston, Jamaica. I remember the swell of that sea. Have you had the news of the trial? Do you get wind of these things? Maybe a captain on a ship speaks to you as you walk along the seafront where I imagine you. I heard my master say that we are property. Speaks of hundreds, thousands as property. I have known it, but now it makes me shudder as those in court who heard it and knew it of themselves. Am I still property? Freedom from being property. Is that what will happen? Is that what happened to you before you left? Might you become property again? I long to hear from you even after all these years. Why don't I hear from you? Your dearest daughter, Dido. And there are a series of letters that she now has. Um, I won't go into all that. It's a bit of a spoiler in the book to kind of mention about the letters too much. Um, and she recounts the whole story of the Zong case um, to it's dealt with in the book. I don't know whether people know about the Zong case. I presume you do. It's very, very famous. But I'm willing to kind of give some basic facts about it in our discussion. Um, but Liz was saying that we should perhaps... The book was, you know, it, the book should have come out last year, and then because of COVID, we postponed its publication um, and thought we would have live events this year. But here we are still on Zoom. Um, so it's it's not written. I mean, in this book, the the film Bell I was telling you about came up in 2014. And I was already two drafts into my novel and I, was, I thought, oh my God, my, that's my story scuppered. Um, but actually the story of Belle is a completely different kind of story. It's a sort of Jane Austen story about marriage um, and doesn't deal with a whole lot of other things, um, which I have been reading to you. Um, so 
my book was not written to address things like, for instance, in a, in a specific sense, Black Lives Matter, for instance, things that have come up, the George Floyd and other killings in the US and here. Um, but of course, as I was getting particularly close to all these events, I could see how the events of my novel were not dissimilar actually to a lot of contemporary events. And the whole question, particularly what struck me was the, you may have heard it in one or two of the excerpts, the concern that Dido has and the concern her mother had about papers and having the right documents as a person um, who had been enslaved or who might be enslaved. Um, and it just kind of echoed for me all that we went through here in England a, a time of the Windrush um, scandal and the creation of the hostile environment um, in the Home Office. Um, and the whole question of immigration and papers and having the right papers. I mean, I know, I know families where the older members of the family just didn't go about and get their papers sorted. It was never their concern. They always just thought they were legally British subjects. Um, and so in a way, the book does address contemporary events um, like that, the whole business of immigration and papers and having documents. Um, and also as a married woman, Dido, um, contemporary concerns about when her children are born, for instance, and the midwife is absolutely scandalized because her first two children are twins and um, the one child is black and the other child is quite fair, as they would say. And she, the, the, the midwife is a sort of, not ex a kind of unconscious racism, a kind of ignorance and so on. Things that people talk about today. Colorism, I think we call it now. Um, these are very, very live um, sort of concerns. Um, conscious and unconscious racism. Um, and Dido experiences a lot of that as she's growing up um, in the Mansfield household. Um, the portrait itself, for me, if you examine it very closely, and it is examined in the novel by both Dido and by Elizabeth de Vignier several years later, is a very conflicted portrait. Some of you may well know that the, port the predominant portraiture of black people in the 18th century, with some notable exceptions, were of enslaved children, boys and girls, in portraits of very famous people. Like at Kenwood itself, there's a painting by Van Dyck of Henrietta of Lorraine. And next to her is a black slave or servant child. And, and they're usually in a position, a sort of fawning position, looking up beseechingly to their masters, mistresses. And they're often there to enhance the, the importance of the master or mistress and the, and the sort of their wealth. Um, and I suppose that wealth is um, there in actually this black person, um, the ownership of that boy or girl. But the Dido portrait is significantly different. And that's why it interests a lot of people because Dido is not in a falling position. She's sort of almost fleeing out of the portrait. Um, maybe we could look at it a bit later again. Um, she's pointing to her cheek. We don't know why, but the great telltale aspect of the portrait is um, the bowl of fruit and flowers that she is carrying. Almost all the portraits of young black um, enslaved or servants are all carrying bowls of fruit and flowers and offering them up as it were to their masters or mistress, a kind of bounty. Um, you can see the portraits up again, and you can see she's carrying this bowl of fruit. Also, she's wearing the turban. The turban is almost in so many of the portraits worn by little enslaved boys and girls. She has the collar. Now, it could be seen as fashionable. Women wore these 
these um, turbans as well in the 18th century with these dyed feathers as well. But it's the, 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 the turban and the flowers are a very, they are aspects of these other portraits. And a lot of people want to argue that Dido and Elizabeth Murray are there as equals and Dido is looking out. So that's very significant. If you're looking out, you share the power with the other person. Um, but as I said before, this portrait was known for a long time as Elizabeth Murray and a negress. Um, she's wearing significantly different clothes. She's not dressed like Elizabeth. Um, in fact, a very interesting program on the BBC called Stitch in Time, where the designer makes clothes in famous paintings and tries to see how they work concluded that this wasn't a real dress at all. You couldn't wear it. It was a costume. It was a kind of masquerade. And I suppose that's the view that I have of this portrait, that she's othered. Um, she is eroticized. She's sexualized. Um, and this name, Belle, it, was, it came up in a review, actually, which I just got from Trinidad in my book by the West Indian um, historian, Bridget Barrington at the University of the West Indies. Belle was a name given to the mulatto woman in the great house, who was either a mistress of the master or uh, available for the enjoyment of his guests. And it's interesting, this name, I don't think there's been much investigation of it, actually, whether it's a real name or not. And of course, the name Dido itself. Um, the, the whole custom of giving enslaved, the, give it, the um, people giving their enslaved servants names like Hector and Caesar and Achilles, those kind of classical names is very, very common. Um, and she carries this name. But it's, she has these sort of relics of these other paintings somehow enfolded here in this portrait. What was David Martin trying to do? It's different. So it's trying to do something, but it would be interesting to discuss that. I'm going to be giving a lecture at Kenwood itself, maybe later next year in January, about this portrait compared with the other portraits. Um, so, yes, I think, uh, oh yes, other points. Um, sorry. Yes. It's also, as you get, came out in the um, in the in the excerpts I read, this and a, a real obsession of, of Elizabeth de Vignes as a grown woman now and married with her own children, the vulnerability of black children. And it's such a well-known story even now. I mean, you know, it's in London with the Susk laws, the killings, the knifings and all that's been going on in America, and even after George Floyd's killing, repeated killings again. So it's a very live um, subject, the vulnerability of black children and young black people. Um, black, black Lives Matter as this sort of thing that we all latch on to now, this, this call to arms, so to speak, has always mattered in my book, but this book was not written specifically to address this specific issue now. And in a way, I was glad for me that I was to bring this book out last year. And there's some distance now. And I think the book does address these issues or you see it as you read it. Several readers have told me this. Now, the last two points I want to make is about how all this history is interpreted and how we get to it and when we enter some of these great houses in England, what we get to know about it, particularly great houses that are built on the proceeds of the slave trade. Um, and that's beginning to happen much more now. English heritage has a policy about that and Kenwood has a policy about it. They had a very good exhibition in 2008 where a lot of that came up. And now there's a copy of the portrait in Kenwood. Um, but unfortunately, there's still this romanticized version of Dido and Lord Mansfield that keeps going. Schoon Palace has merchandised the whole thing since the film. And the fact that we now know it's David Martin, who is the, 
the artist, which came up on Fake and Fortune program on the BBC. Um, but as what I think I do, I mean, I don't really call myself an historical novelist. I call my, I, I am interested in going to these historical stories and go places and finding the little bits and pieces that you have and through what Marina Warner, who has given a sort of encouragement to this book has said is through a kind of fictive empathy. Um, is actually beyond the facts, the basic facts of dates and to a kind of truth about history um, in trying to get to, in, in, in this book to do that by actually giving Dido a voice. So the book is, the story is told in her consciousness. It's, it, it, is, it is told third person narrative, but it's within her consciousness. Um, it had originally been written in the first completely uh, for various reasons. So that's kind of like how I say, I hope I'm gone on too long and we can perhaps have you talking about what you want to talk about and, or ask or please say things. Yeah. But thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. That was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and so fascinating. And I feel a bit frustrated I haven't read the book yet, but perhaps it's nicer to hear hear you introduce the book, and then when I'm reading it, then I'll I'll, I'll get a lot more out of it. I'm sure. Um, thank you so much. That was just brilliant, and so many things to follow up. So um, I'm going to ask um, Ange first of all if she wants to. Uh... Yeah. Yes. Lawrence, thank you so much for what you've said about the book. This thank morning. you. It's been most interesting. I'm in the middle of reading it and enjoying it enormously, and particularly the way you thank bring you. the characters alive, as well as the issues, which, as you say are so relevant. One thing that fascinates me reading it is you, you've got a huge density of historical detail, food, illness, um, quorum fields, um, treatments, plants, broader things going on from, from the more familiar kind of cultural picture of Canaletto and so on and so on. So there's a massive amount of context that you give us. Which, which is, and it's very interesting, kind of feeling one's way into London in that way. But I wondered, how do you, how do you strike a balance between the facts and the story when you're writing? Um, um, yeah, yeah, because it's an important balance, isn't it? Not to, it's not simply information; it's a novel. You turn what was historical truth and speculation into a story but yeah, you are yeah. informing as well and I'm interested in in how you strike that balance. Well for instance like it's interesting you mentioned Canaletto because actually that passage where I think it's in the description of Randy Gardens which Canaletto had painted yeah. and where the boy Mozart played and my agent who was always very um, kind of alert to all this research and what was allowed or what wasn't allowed. You know, I mean, Hilary Mantel has a wonderful, well, as I take it when she speaks, because I enjoy her um, approach to history actually enormously, um, lots of wallpaper. Now, Hilary Mantel has an enormous amount of wallpaper and one has to be careful because it could become a bit clunky. Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. And you just think, oh, well, here's a novelist just, you know, showing off with a bit of research. So actually, while there are these little bits, quorum feels, these things, I think actually I, I've, I've kind of been quite severe <laughs> in some ways. Um, I, I might have wanted more, but I was, right. I, I have to say readers, you know, who advised me, my editor, Polly, particularly marvelous editor, Polly Patello. Yes, um, yes we were at And a wonderful reader very early on, a man called Alan Ma, who 
was the editor at Tyndall Street Press, which then bought up just after my last novel was bought uh, and published, um, but works for something called the Literary Agency. But actually just as my last editor, he was very good. And he turned me around from my first person um, kind of novel that I had written and said, look, Lawrence, you've got a really, really poignant story here and it must not be cluttered with all kinds of things. Just let it be told. And that, I, I hope that's what's happened, um, that it has actually become much plainer in its telling. And some of my other books are actually quite rich, <laughs> sort of perhaps too rich uh, at times. Um, I mean, I was very inspired in my beginnings with magic realism and things like that. Mm. Um, so this, I'm glad you brought this up and I hope you don't think it's too much, though I quite like it. <laughs> I like my mention of Canaletto and the boy Mozart, yes. But there, so some pieces are needed, some bits were needed. And just every now and then that you know where you are, you know, and where we are in the 18th century, yes. Yeah. Thanks for that point. Did you have more to say on it? Yeah. Perhaps other people would like to join in. I don't want to monopolize, but I just, yes, I'm just fascinated as a writer too. Yes. How yes. you actually, how you, how you strike that balance. And as you say, you have to be careful for it not to be indigestible information. Yes. But yes. I felt it was rich and it provides us with a, with that alternative view. Um, of London and of the slave trade and of history at that time, very importantly, I think. Yes. I have to say, um, I, I looked on Amazon and you can read the first three chapters on Amazon. Um, and uh, and I, I found that absolutely fascinating, that image of London because I'm not a very experienced reader of historical fiction uh, or how, how or this no, uh, a novel like this, I was a bit confused and serves me right for not getting the book here in time, but uh, I think I'll have to, I'll have to go for the ebook option. Um, Elizabeth Devine, Elizabeth- Devinier. Devinier. Yeah. Is she, is that a real factual, yeah, she, she married John de Vignier. That's factual. And that's recorded and you... Yeah, yeah we have her marriage certificate. When, oh. when the um, exhibition at Kenwood in 2008 was done, an exhibition called Justice and Slavery and Legacy, I think it was called. Yeah. Um, they employed a genealogist from the BBC who discovered, um, her name is out of my mind for a moment, it's in my acknowledgements. Um, she discovered the, 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 the birth certificates, all the relevant birth certificates and marriage certificates, um, which, which give us the names, of course, and the dates, some very important dates, yes. So that's all factual, but we don't, we have his name. Nobody knows quite who John de Vigne was. There are lots of speculations and the speculations could take you into different stories. And I chose to go with this one story that he came from the colonies. And I changed, I, I chose to go with what I saw as a kind of French sounding name. And that um, he is, um, has a, he has, his background is from Martinique, but mm. he cut his, the name that he's carrying is not his name. He's not been given his father's name, just like Dido was not given her father's name. Um, just incidentally, John Lindsay had th three, uh, two or three other illegitimate children and several mistresses and had no wives, no children from his wife, Mary Milner. That's also historical. Um, so John de Vigne, we'd know, John de Vigne is part of my fiction. Yeah, apart from his name, yes. So that's, that's fascinating and that reassures me somewhat because I think I've confessed to people before. Um, I was never an enthusiast for reading historical fiction because I wanted to know what historical reality was. I had a 
a very uh, poor poor grasp of of that. So uh, so the idea of reading fictionalized versions was was not favourite with me but I can now understand and it does give an opportunity to learn so much about so many other um, things that were going on and it sets it in time and I think this is fascinating and I think as yeah. we're trying to because one of the purposes of this is to explore how we can learn about black history what ways can we learn about black history? How can we be more effective in helping others to learn about black history? And, and to have your explanation is just, just fascinating. So I'm just going to ask if there are any other people who've got, wait a minute, I've got somebody here. Good, but before we move on, Liz, can I just, oh. sorry, um, Jim. Um, I just add that this, what I was just saying thing about trying to get at truth is something that Toni Morrison, who I admire yes. greatly in her book, Beloved. I don't feel I, what anybody can approach all this material without thinking of Beloved. And, you know, she takes this factual thing, for instance, this very factual story, I've forgotten her first name, the woman Ghana, who kills her child rather than have it delivered into slavery. But of course, her story, Beloved, is a complete fiction. The woman's name is Seth. Seth in, in Beloved. Seth. Pardon? Sorry? Seth. Seth, yes. Yeah. She's called Seth. Um, I was looking for the first name. Was it Elizabeth Garner? Do you remember? I don't know. But um, what I'm saying is here is a historical situation. But of course, Morrison's writing is a fiction, um, you know, um, this is, we were talking about curriculums early on, just throw this in quickly before Jim can come in. I mean, the astonishing thing is Beloved is allowed to be a set text in England and some of the boards, but it's actually put there as a Gothic novel because there's a ghost in it. I mean, I just <laughs> think it's completely scandalous <laughs> that that is the only way it can be brought in after Michael Gove's complete sort of trashing of the a lot of work I did as a teacher years ago in, in a much broader curriculum but anyway that's another whole subject well, um Jim what did you have to thank say you. thank you I must say I admire your accent I admire well, your that accent. is my accent yeah <laughs> <laughs> the one you improvise I was an idiot, you know. but yeah that was really lovely what an interesting I, I, story I dramatize it a bit yeah, I wonder what you have copied uh, for thank sale. You. Where, uh, is it sold through Amazon? Is it sold through Amazon? Or oh, it's everywhere Amazon now, copies? yes. Yeah. Are, you, are you in the UK? Where are you? Yes, I'm in Luton in Bedfordshire. Right. Well, what my publisher, it's on Amazon. What my publisher often um, advises, if you want an alternative to Amazon, of course, is your local bookshop which we very much encourage. But also, wow. if you want to do it online, there's a thing called bookshop.org, which is something which has been um, organized to help small presses and small bookshops. Yes. Um, so it's a kind, because, you know, Amazon sort of... Um, but I would, uh, I, I want to ask... Up everything, you know, they take the huge chunk out of the sales, yeah. I want to ask you, Lawrence, what are you yeah. considered or what you have done talk to children in schools, but you have the kind of manner and, uh, mm. and the style, I think, that would be so appreciated uh, by teachers and Thank by you. especially yeah. youngsters in our schools. Well, I, I taught for 32 you. years <laughs> you know, in, here, in Trinidad. <laughs> and here. I am a teacher. I wouldn't say all my students would agree with you, mind you. <laughs> yeah. Of what part of the country you live? I live in London, in Islington. All oh, right, oh, uh, yeah. Corbyn's neighbour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good to say, good to hear from you today. Really interesting. But I mean, you know, um, my accent. I, I came to England when I was 19. Um, a whole different story there. But um, when I started teaching in Peckham, I was teaching in a class of mostly West Indian, children with West, West Indian background. 
and I began to read Sam Selvin's stories to them. Sam Selvin, a Trinidad writer, yes. you might know. Uh, Lonely Londoners. Lonely Londoners, yeah, certainly. But I was reading Waves of Sunlight, his short stories. And I just found that I could read it. You know, I knew how to read Sam and I just kind of discovered my accent again. And, you know, my accent so my accent's all over the place, basically. Actually, everybody thinks I'm Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, asking no. Me I'm Welsh. I was asked the other day, which part of Wales are you from? And I was quite um, chuffed by that because it meant my Trinidad accent hadn't completely disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Maharaj. Anyway, thanks for your observation. Okay, so um, We've got a, a, a thank you from Caroline. So any any other specific questions or points you want to raise? Um, I, I don't mind. I don't mind going on a bit more. Just just to ask. I mean, it's I, I thought Boomi was saying something. You know? Oh, I beg your pardon. Boomi. Oh, Boomi. Bo no, my Bo hand isn't up. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Boomi, over to you. No, my hand wasn't up. I uh, oh, my <laughs> 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 hand it wasn't up. <laughs> I can't see you too well. That's why. All right then. Bunmi has joined us a little late, Lawrence, because she's right. in Canada. Yeah, um, right. and, uh, it's even more difficult. So uh, we appreciate the fact you're here, Bunmi. That's wonderful. Where okay. in Canada are you? I'm in Ontario. In Ontario, right? Homonville, Ontario. Right. And Bunmi is also an author, um, but uh, our link with Bunmi is because she's got the Sankova Pan-African series and she does short films, um, conversations every day, every day on YouTube. She's a YouTube star, aren't you, Bunmi? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we've been looking at dad great. writers in Toronto and other places in Oh yes, there are, there are, there are. I, 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 I'm, I, I was well. Since I've been given the, uh, um, the mic, so to say, I was just going to say, I, I write historical novels as well, you yeah. know, and I really, really right. envy you the outlet you have, because it's been virtually impossible. Even just even getting agents to read historical novels set in Africa, right? So, I, but I I I enjoy the bit of yours that I, I've read. I am definitely going to look it up and 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 and, and pick up a copy. Sounds like a really interesting. I think uh, you probably story. need a good agent. Yeah, you, you can you can't get a, you you can't get an agent if they don't even want to read the kind of stuff you write. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's yeah, a really true. interesting point, Bunmi, because um, there are small publishers with an interest, and I think now we're recognising how important it is that Afri Black history, from which is African history, it's a really important um, important aspect and we need to do more of it. Simon's just saying in the chat that um, Jacaranda books in the UK, um, but also it's interesting that there's two of us here who know Polly, Polly Patillo. Um, Ange was just saying, I don't know if you caught it, Lawrence, but Ange actually went to school with Polly. <laughs> oh, did. Yeah, and I'm she's written me a very Ange, nice letter. <laughs> So oh, yeah, um, there you are again. Well, so you know would, Polly, right. right. Yeah, In it would past. be really nice. Nice if we could talk to Polly. And I also mm. know Pansy Ben from Arawak Publications. Do you know Pen Pansy, Lawrence? No, I don't, no, no. Again, in but the I Caribbean. Around the press, yeah. Yeah, but I don't know, Bonmi, if you know the Hansib publishers. No, I don't. I'll look you them know, up. -based, and they're very interested in uh, Black History type um novels and uh, well, not about novels, but books. so so that's another way that we can link Thank um and, and see how we can share so um and jim's saying that um 
<laughs> so Jim wants a publisher for his next book too. <laughs> yes. Okay, Jim. Thank you very much indeed. I for just that. want to warn colleagues, though, uh, Liz. I, I had three books published with Hansib, and uh, the third one I had to take him to court, and the oh, court dear, had, right. the court <laughs> had to order them to publish a book. Be very careful because it's self-publication, but. I bought 300 copies, and every time I tried to sell it, Hansib already sold the copies without even telling me. So I targeted all the schools and so on, but I said we've already bought it from Hansib. I had no commission, and so be very careful. Okay, all right. That's wise words, Jim, and I, I'm not into publishing, but um, obviously we've got uh, both Bunmi and Lawrence, who got expertise in this field. So, Ange, do you want to just um, take the last points then, unless there's anything else from anyone else? Thank you, Ange. Just, just very briefly, I think the power of historical fiction, particularly for children and the potential, is immense. There was an, uh, an interview in The Guardian at the weekend with, I think, Kit DeWall, who said, the first book he remembered reading was Eagle of the Ninth by Rosemary Sapcliffe, oh, yeah. you know, which was right back in the 50s. And I think the impact of an affective account, an account which enables people to, to feel how people might have felt, is so often the starting point for people's interest in their own history um, and, and is such a, a deep treasure trove, really. And thank you for sharing what what you've written with us. But isn't that the whole point of fiction anyway? I mean, fiction is about being able to enter other people's lives. Stories, yes, absolutely. All, all stories, you know, mm. even if they're completely fictional and not historic, you know, based Complete. on historical yeah. figures. Um, it's about, yes, I mean, I think I wrote something down. It's, it's, it's really about, because, I mean, I know there's some wonderful histories. I mean, I love write, reading histories as well, um, but it is the feel. It's it's not just knowing the information. It's about feeling the exactly. life, mm. um, and that's part of the truth. I think that a novelist, yes, the emotional or, truth, yes. the emotional truth that the novelist is trying to to enter actually mm. and to communicate. Mm. Yeah. Well, I. I think that's just fascinating. And thanks, Ange, very much indeed. Angie's going to help. Um, Gwyneth, are you going to? Gwyneth? I was, yes. just, I, I was just going to ask a personal question of Lawrence um, with Trinidad. And do you know the Bain family there? I certainly know the name. Yeah, I know, oh. I have known Baines. I don't know which Baines, that's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's fine okay Thanks. well we'll catch up in a little bit for, for anything else so thank you i think think your presentation was absolutely fascinating yeah. and thank you so much because you also then did address the issues about the contemporary issues about race and identity and these are particularly critical times we are living through history at the at present and um, in so many different ways. And, and the issues about race as, as well and, and the comparison, um, you obviously use the story really well to, to, to explore that. And then also um, because of the um, provenance of the painting and it, its position at Schoon Castle, you know, it, it also brings in all the colonial history in the great uh, and great houses and also the link with Kenwood as well. And I looked at how English heritage tell the, the Dido Bell story on, on their page. They've got a little film about it. And as you say, it is a bit romanticized. So I was just fascinating to hear the, the that the next part of her life that you write about at the beginning of the book is, um, is real <laughs> so i'm highly delighted about that um 
and then helping to, to, you know, to bring to the surface these histories so that we can understand more. So in the book, clearly, there are lots of threads about what was going on at that actual time. And I think the more we can understand detail like that about what was going on at, in a, at a particular phase and, and what the implications were, and certainly Lord Mansfield's role with the, the cases that he, he oversaw, um, because it bringing in in a number of important points then and and fitting it in to the progression towards abolition um, so it, it's just been absolutely fascinating and I, I can't thank you enough thank you very much indeed Lawrence it's brilliant yeah brilliant. thank you very much it's very really nice okay. to talk here lovely I mean, well, we'll all the subjects you're discussing curriculum in education and indentureship all these I mean yes I, I would certainly like to share some of the stuff of my Golconda project on indentureship with you sometime wonderful yeah. wonderful well we'll formally wrap oh, up here and we can continue with any further discussion so thanks very much everybody Thank you. and Thanks. Simon if you can wrap the recording up <laughs>